Welcome to the lecture on the challenge of cultural relativism, which is the second chapter of James and Stuart Rachel's The Elements of Moral Philosophy. I'm Andrew Chapman, and in this lecture, we'll be investigating whether cultures have their own moral facts. More specifically, we'll be investigating the thesis of cultural moral relativism. To many people, this observation, different cultures have different moral codes, seems like the key to understanding morality. There are no universal moral truths, they say. The customs of different societies are all that exist. To call a custom correct or incorrect would imply that we can judge that custom by some independent standard of right and wrong. But no such standard exists. Every standard is culture-bound. This line of thought, more than any other, has persuaded people to be skeptical about ethics. Cultural relativism says, in effect, that there is no such thing as universal truth in ethics. There are only the various cultural codes and nothing more. Cultural relativism challenges our belief in the objectivity and universality of moral truth. So say James and Stuart Rachels. James and Stuart Rachels, and here's a picture that I found of the two of them from the late 80s. This is from Stuart Rachels' high school graduation, are the co-authors of one of the most famous and popular intro ethics textbooks, The Elements of Moral Philosophy. James Rachels died in 2003, but Stuart Rachels continues to uh, edit and improve on the new editions of the book. If you're looking for a good intro ethics textbook, if some of the things that we talk about here pique your interest in ethics, you could do much worse than checking out the elements of moral philosophy. It's one of the few very good intro ethics texts. Before we get into the discussion of precisely what cultural moral relativism is, it'll help us to remember what ethics is. Ethics, or morality, and I'll be using the term synonymously, is the study of the right and the wrong, the good and the bad, the better and worse, the virtuous and the vicious, the fair and the unfair, the just and unjust, from the perspective of the best overall reasons. Thus, the evidence employed by ethicists is reason and argumentation. What the thing that we should do is, is going to be the thing that's supported by the best overall reasons. And one of our goals as ethicists is to look for these reasons, to evaluate them, to show them to other people, to ask them what they think of the reasons, to get people's perspectives from different times, from different traditions, and to see what we can make of the ethical evidence. Ethics is an investigative discipline. It's concerned with what is true in its particular uh, domain, namely ethics. Just as, for example, biologists are concerned with determining what's true about particular cell functions, ethicists are concerned with determining what's true about the right and the wrong, the good and the bad, the better and the worse, etc. And just as biologists aren't concerned with what anyone's mere opinion is concerning particular cell functions, ethicists aren't concerned with what anyone's mere opinion is concerning what's right, wrong, good, bad, better, worse. It might be a job for a historian of science or an anthropologist or a sociologist to look at what people have believed across time about biological facts. But the biologist is in the business of figuring out what's true about biology. Similarly, it might be the business of the anthropologist, the historian, the sociologist to see what different people in different places across time have believed about ethics, but the ethicist isn't in the business of looking at people's particular beliefs. The ethicist is in the business of investigating what the truth is about ethics. In order to understand ethics, we need to understand a central distinction in philosophy. That's the distinction between descriptivity and normativity. Descriptivity and normativity are mutually exclusive properties that are possessed by declarative propositions. A declarative proposition is just one that represents something as being the case, as being true. 
So there are many other sorts of propositions. Declarative ones are just the ones that, says, that say, this is true. Descriptive propositions, on the one hand, are those that express that the world is, was, or will be some certain way. A descriptive proposition is true if and only if it accurately represents the world. And it's still true independent of what anybody thinks about it, whether we can figure out whether it's true or not. Normative propositions, on the other hand, are those that express that the world ought to be, ought to have been in the past or ought to be in the future some particular way. And just as with descriptive propositions, normative propositions are true if the facts line up with how normative propositions say the facts are. An easy shorthand for the descriptive normative distinction is the is-ought distinction. You can see that normativity is about what ought to be the case, descriptivity is about what is the case. Also, when we're doing ethics, thinking about ethical or moral situations, it's important to remember a number of conceptual distinctions between morality and things that are not morality. It's important to remember these distinctions because if we confuse morality with something morality isn't, we'll be talking past one another when we talk about morality or we'll be uh, conflating or equivocating um, between different concepts that seem to be the same concept but aren't. The first conceptual distinction that it's important to remember is morality versus the law. Sometimes the law and morality match up with each other, but sometimes the law is immoral. Sometimes we try to base the law on morality and we misfire, but even further, sometimes we just need laws that are arbitrary, that have nothing to do with morality, like, for example, when tax day is in the United States. It has nothing to do with morality, we just needed to pick a day. Second distinction, morality versus reward and punishment. Sometimes we're rewarded for doing the right thing, punished for doing the wrong thing, but sometimes, unfortunately, we're rewarded for doing the wrong thing and punished for doing the right thing. So morality is not the same thing as reward and punishment. It would be very nice if we were always rewarded for doing the right thing, as I've said, but we're not. Sometimes people just don't even recognize that we've done the right thing, and sometimes we get away with doing the wrong thing. Third distinction, morality versus motivation. What we're motivated to do is sometimes what the moral thing is. Sometimes we're motivated to do the right thing and against doing the wrong thing. But sometimes, unfortunately, we're motivated to do the wrong thing or we're motivated against doing the right thing. Just because we want to do something, that doesn't make it right. Just because we don't want to do something doesn't mean that we should do it. Fourth distinction, morality versus commands and threats. Sometimes people might command that we do things. Sometimes people might threaten us. If we don't do particular things, they'll hurt us or something like that. Morality isn't the same as commands or threats. Sometimes, for example, there might be a despotic ruler who tells us that we have to do things. The fact that the ruler commands that we do these things doesn't make them moral. Morality is something separate from that. Fifth distinction is the distinction between morality and beliefs. When we believe things about morality, most of the time we try to believe what's true about morality, but sometimes we get it wrong. What we merely believe about morality is about morality, but isn't identical with morality itself. And finally, Morality versus claims to morality. Sometimes people are very loud about the fact that they have the correct moral system. What they do is right and what other people do is wrong. Well, they might be correct, but just as moral beliefs can end up being false, can end up being wrong, claims to morality can end up being false or wrong. So again, it's important to remember to keep all of these things, law, reward and punishment, motivation, commands and threats, beliefs, and claims to morality separate from what morality actually is. Now let's start to talk about moral relativism. It's easy to understand moral relativism by contrasting it with its opposite, moral absolutism. Moral absolutism is the thesis that the moral facts are absolute. And what that means in this context is that the way that the moral facts are, the particular moral facts that there are, 
are not explainable in terms of some further fact. What makes moral propositions true, then, is the facts, period. So notice in the diagram that I've given you, you have moral facts. They make moral truths true. There is no, more, there, there is no further moral thing here relevant to what makes the moral facts the moral facts. Contrast this with relativism. Moral relativism is the thesis that the moral facts are relativized to or determined by some further fact. What makes the moral propositions true is the facts as well as whatever relativizing factor determines what the moral facts are. So you can see on the diagram that I've give you, given you, some relativizing factor determines what the moral facts are, and the moral facts determine what the moral truths are. So, if you have different relativizing factors in different times, different places, different cultures, you can see that those might give rise to different moral facts, which would give rise to different moral truths. And this is the heart of relativism. Here are a couple things that relativism is not, just to keep clear in our minds the distinction between relativism and the other things that relativism isn't. Relativism is not a position known as subjectivism. While moral relativism holds that the moral facts are relativized to some further factor, these facts are nonetheless facts. So whatever we mean by facts, relativism says that there are moral facts, and those facts are applicable to all the people who are relevant to those particular facts. Subjectivism, on the other hand, is the position that there are no moral facts per se. What we normally mean by fact, the subjectivist denies that there are those with respect to morality. Instead, says the subjectivist, different people feel different ways about morality or have different beliefs about morality, and that's the end of it. So the subjectivist will hold that if there's anything that can be properly called morality, it's individual subjective states of individual people and nothing more. Again, subjectivism is not relativism, that the relativist says there are moral facts. They're just relativized to particular things. The subjectivist is denying the existence of moral facts as we generally conceive of moral facts. Even further, relativism is not nihilism about morality. Moral relativism is not the position that there are no such things as moral facts or truths at all. Instead, relativism is the position that there are such things as moral facts and that these facts are merely relativized to some further thing. Contrast that with moral nihilism, which is the position that there are no such things as moral facts or truths at all. Now, you might notice uh, here that there is a tight connection between subjectivism and nihilism, and that's something over and above what I want to discuss here, but you're right that there is a tight connection between those two theses. It is very important for us to keep the positions of relativism and nihilism separate, since, one, nihilism denies what relativism affirmed, namely that there are moral facts or truths. Nihilism says there are no such things as those. Well, relativism says, yes, there are. It's just sort of complicated how they get to be the way they are. And it's also very important for us to keep relativism and nihilism separate because very smart public figures insist on confusing these positions, for example, by bemoaning, quote, our modern relativistic culture and then explaining relativism in terms of nihilism. Relativism is a very complicated position. It doesn't just say there aren't morals. So if what um, very smart public figures are upset about is people claiming that there are no such things as uh, moral truths or moral facts, what they're talking about is nihilism and not relativism. Let's talk about a very specific sort of moral relativism but nonetheless the most popular sort of moral relativism known as cultural moral relativism. So there can be very, uh, many different sorts of relativism, both in terms of what it is that's relativized and in terms of what it is that the thing is relativized to. 
In all forms of moral relativism, it's morality or the moral facts or the moral truths that are the thing that's relativized. And in cultural moral relativism, morality is relativized to the beliefs, practices, or traditions of particular cultures, such that different cultures, if their beliefs, practices, or traditions are sufficiently different from one another, may end up having different moral facts. We'll continue talking just about cultural moral relativism for the rest of this lecture. Why should anybody think that cultural moral relativism is true? It's a pretty complicated, involved position. The standard argument for cultural moral relativism is known as the argument from cultural differences. It takes note of a specific fact out there in the world and then draws a conclusion about the nature of morality from that fact. And that fact is the obvious fact to anybody who's ever dealt with a different culture, that different cultures have different beliefs, practices, and traditions regarding morality. So, says the argument from cultural differences, these different cultures do have these different beliefs, practices, and traditions regarding morality, and therefore, different moral facts apply to different cultures. Two is just the thesis of cultural moral relativism, and what's supposed to support that is one. Now we should ask ourselves, is this a good argument? What we're asking ourselves here isn't whether one is true. We're asking whether this argument, one, supports two, the thesis of cultural moral relativism that different moral facts apply to different cultures. An argument is a good argument if its premises support its conclusion, meaning that the premises make the conclusion true, and if the premises actually are true. Well, we know that the premise, the one and only premise here, is true, that different cultures have different beliefs and practices regarding morality. But, unfortunately, that premise doesn't support that conclusion. And the way that we know this is that there are many ways for that premise to be true without the conclusion thereby having to be true. One of the ways that the premise might be true and the conclusion might be false is if all of the cultures are wrong about morality. If everybody's wrong about morality, that doesn't mean that there are different moral facts that apply to different cultures. It means that people have different beliefs and practices and traditions and all of them are wrong. Or maybe people have different beliefs, practices, and traditions regarding morality and some of them are more right than others. That would be a way for one to be true and for two to nonetheless be false. Now, this isn't saying that cultural moral relativism is false. What it's saying is that the central argument in favor of cultural moral relativism isn't a good argument. Another way to see that this is a very bad argument is to consider an argument that uses analogous reasoning. Consider an analogous argument for what we can call cultural, cultural geological relativism, the thesis that different geological facts apply to different cultures. First premise, different cultures have different beliefs, practices, and traditions regarding geology. Therefore, different geological facts apply to different cultures. Nobody would accept this argument. If different people have different beliefs, practices, and traditions regarding geology, we would all say, well, either they're all wrong or one of them's right and the rest of them are wrong. If we're not going to accept this sort of argument when it comes to geology, then we shouldn't accept it when it comes to morality, unless we already have some good reason to think that morality is relativistic, and then we wouldn't need an argument to begin with. Now, one thing that we might ask ourselves, since one says that different cultures have different beliefs, practices, and traditions, and that seems clearly true, is, is it actually true that there are these intense cultural differences when it comes to morality. When we look at different cultures, it really does seem like there are different moral beliefs, but are there different moral beliefs? Well, in fact, there's good reason to think 
that that only premise of the argument from cultural differences is false. That while there are apparently different things going on on the surface, in fact, there aren't really differences in what's morally salient here. In order to see this, let's distinguish between what we can call the moral content and the descriptive content of beliefs, practices, and traditions. The moral content says what ought to be done morally, while the descriptive content just says how we can accomplish what ought to be done morally. So take a non-moral analogy. Maybe it's the case that I ought to clean the gutters, uh, clean the leaves out of my gutters. That's what I ought to do. And the best way to do that would be to go get um, a ladder and to climb up there and scoop out the leaves. Going and getting the ladder tells me how I can do that thing. And then the fact that I ought to do that thing, that's what's really morally important here. So think about two different cultures. One culture says that the dead should be burned. That's how you should deal with the dead. The second culture says that the dead should be eaten, not burned. That's what you should do with the dead. Well, if we look a little deeper at why these cultures have this apparent moral difference, we can see that they're actually in agreement with each other in terms of the moral content of their beliefs, practices, and traditions. They agree that the dead should be respected. Respect is the relevant moral thing here, and that's what we should do with the dead. We should respect them. What these two cultures disagree on is how respect can best be accomplished. But that's not a moral disagreement. That's just a disagreement about the best way to go about doing something. Similarly, if I said, I ought to clean the gutters, so I'm going to go get a ladder, and you said, why don't you just climb up onto the roof? You don't need a ladder. We wouldn't be disagreeing about whether I needed to clean the gutters, the thing that I ought to do. What would we be disagreeing about is the best way to do that. So it might not even be the case, given the clear and obvious evidence that we have that cultures behave differently, that that behavior is actually due to a moral difference. Now, there might actually be some negative implications of cultural relativism. That central argument for relativism, the argument from cultural differences, is unsound. We already saw that. The premises don't support the conclusion, and it might even be the case that the premise is false. So unless a good argument can be found to replace that argument, cultural relativism is an unsupported position. But unsupported positions can nonetheless be true. However, things are worse than just being unsupported for cultural relativism. In addition to there being scant reasons to accept cultural relativism, there are actually ample reasons to reject cultural relativism. Here I'll give you three of the negative implications for relativism, and then I'll attempt to diagnose some of the problems with relativism and show that even the motivation behind relativism is generally based on confusions or misunderstandings about what we ought to be promoting as good human citizens of the world. The three negative implications that I'll talk about first are, one, cultural relativism makes cross-cultural criticism impossible. Two, cultural relativism makes criticism of our own culture impossible. And three, cultural relativism makes moral progress impossible. I'll deal with these one at a time. First, cultural relativism makes it impossible for us to criticize other cultures. Now, at first we thought that this was a very good thing about cultural relativism, but is it? Well, here are Rachel's and Rachel's, they say. For example, the Chinese government has long had a history of repressing political dissent within its own borders. At any given time, thousands of political prisoners in China are doing hard labor. In the Tiananmen Square episode of 1989, Chinese troops slaughtered hundreds, if not thousands, of peaceful protesters. Cultural relativism would preclude us from saying that the Chinese government's policies of oppression are wrong. We could not even say that a society that respects free speech is a 
better society than the Chinese society, for that would also imply a universal standard of comparison. The failure to condemn these practices does not seem so enlightened. On the contrary, political oppression seems wrong wherever it occurs. Nevertheless, if we accept cultural relativism, we have to regard such practices as immune from criticism. So the thought here is that, at first it seemed enlightened to say other cultures have their own practices, therefore there are different moral standards that apply to different cultures. The problem is, there are some practices, some beliefs, some traditions that are so abhorrent that maybe we don't want to condemn them, but we do want to at least say maybe those cultures should work toward a better standard, or maybe a culture that doesn't have particular awful practices is a better culture. But if cultural relativism is true, we can't say that at all. Their standards are correct. Our standards are correct. And we can't even say that their standards are wrong from our position, because there's no possibility of evaluating their standards from our position. The standards are independent of each other. A second negative implication of cultural relativism is that we can't even criticize our own culture. Say Rachel's and Rachel's. Cultural relativism suggests a simple test for determining what is right and what is wrong. All we need to do is ask whether the action is in line with the code of the society in question. Suppose a resident of India wonders whether her country's caste system, a system of rigid social hierarchy, is morally correct. All she has to do is ask whether this system conforms to her society's moral code. If it does, there's nothing to worry about, at least from a moral point of view. How could we ever criticize our own society if the standards of criticism, the things that make criticism possible, are dependent on the very society that we are trying to criticize? If this India example doesn't grab you, consider. Certainly you have some opinions about how the United States handles its political affairs. Maybe you think that we ought to have a president from some particular political party the next time there's a presidential election, or maybe you think that the Supreme Court has made a good or bad decision, or maybe you think that particular institutions that the United States thinks are good or bad institutions are ones that we shouldn't be thinking about in that way. Well. Your opinions, according to cultural relativism, aren't just your opinions. They make no sense at all. You can't have negative or critical opinions, uh, or even positive opinions, about things that are already within your society. They just are the way your society works. And there's nothing moral to say about it other than that just is the moral standards. You might notice that this gives rise to a third problem. If cultural relativism is true, then we can never make moral progress. Say Rachel's and Rachel's. Throughout most of Western history, the place of women in society was narrowly defined. Women could not own property, they could not vote or hold political office, and they were under the almost absolute control of their husbands or fathers. Recently, much of this has changed, and most people think of it as progress. But if cultural relativism is correct, can we legitimately view this as progress? Progress means replacing the old ways with new and improved ways. But by what standard do we judge the new ways as better? So think about the passage of the 19th Amendment in the United States, or think about the abolition of institutionalized government-supported, or at least sanctioned, slavery. Think about recent rulings concerning gay rights. Many people think that we've made moral progress with respect to these things. Even if you're on the other side and you think these things are morally regressive, there's nothing that you can say about them. They just are what the society does. So while there might be moral change between one time period and the next. There's never moral progress. No way of doing anything is ever any better than any other way of doing anything. And not only does it make it impossible for us to say we have made progress, it makes it impossible for us to ever hope to make progress. 
any hopes that things will change, even if you don't describe that in terms of being better, are misguided. Why would you want something to change? If cultural relativism is true, we can't make sense of differences in behavior across time. Everything is right then, everything is right now, everything will be right in the future. Now, it might seem at this point that there are a lot of problems for cultural moral relativism. What's gone wrong here? Well, it might just be the case that moral relativism is a confusion, that people have confused different terms or concepts and thought that they were talking about morality when instead they're talking about something else. In fact, it often looks as if those who are purporting to support cultural relativism are confusing morality with one or more of custom, tradition, belief, or law. But morality is not the same thing as custom, tradition, belief, or law. The moral relativist is saying that custom, tradition, belief, law, these things either are morality or determine morality. But why should we think that, since morality is a separate concept? It's an entirely different thing. If someone wants to claim that there is no such thing as morality, that's fine. That's moral nihilism. But morality is not the same thing as any of these other things. To say that two cultures have different customs or traditions or beliefs or laws isn't to say that there are two different sorts of moral facts that apply to those cultures. And we can see that by just saying morality is the same across the cultures, but they have different beliefs about that morality. There's nothing incoherent about saying that, but there would be if cultural moral relativism were true. Now, I think that this happens because, unfortunately, sometimes people use that term morality ambiguously to variously pick out the concepts of moral facts, moral beliefs, moral customs, and moral traditions. Sometimes you hear people say, my morals, or the morals of my church, or our morals growing up, or our traditions' morals. What they're saying there is something about their traditions, moral beliefs, moral customs, something like that. But we shouldn't take them to be saying something about moral facts unless someone can give an argument that moral facts are identical to those things or determined by those things. And as we've seen, the famous argument, the argument from cultural differences, is severely problematic. You might even think at this point that relativism isn't just a confusion, it's in fact incoherent. Maybe it's internally inco inconsistent. Why would we think this? Well, let's remember what morality is. Morality is the domain of the right and the wrong, the good and the bad, the better and the worse, etc., from the perspective of the best all things considered reasons. That last part is important there, the all things considered reasons. So if anybody's going to put forward a theory that they claim is a moral theory, it has to be consistent with what we're claiming morality is. Notice that this definition of morality doesn't take a stance on relativism. It just says this is what morality generally is. It's this normative domain of how we ought to act given the reasons. But if cultural relativism is correct, then it's not just morality that's relativized, but reasons are also relativized to different cultures. This isn't just to say that different cultures take different reasons to be more or less persuasive, but that reasons themselves become good or bad, support different moral positions depending on the relevant culture. The reason that reasons themselves would need to be relativized is that at its base, at its bottom, at the most fundamental level, morality just is reasons. And so if morality changes from culture to culture, so do reasons. But we're getting very close to incoherence here once we say that reasons get relativized. If reasons have any purchase at all in terms of guiding our actions and our beliefs, it can't just be the case that anything goes with respect to the interpretation of reasons. Imagine that I have some reason to do something, 
And the reason doesn't tell me whether I should actually do that thing or some other thing. I just made up whether the reason said I should do this or that. Well, we might think that the reason itself doesn't tell me anything at all. I'm just using the reason as an ad hoc, after-the-fact justification of what I'm up to. But if morality is all about reasons, and reasons are just whatever we want them to be, then morality is just ever whatever we want it to be. But this is incoherent. This incoherence is exactly what cultural relativism says, that reasons are whatever we want them to be. There's no good reason ever to do one thing over another thing for a culture. Cultures just make things up. Now, sometimes people support relativism because they think that if you support the opposite of relativism, the claim that there are moral standards that apply to more than one culture, that you're against tolerance. In fact, exactly the opposite is the case. If you support moral relativism, you're against tolerance. Let me show you why. What is tolerance? Well, if you tolerate my behavior, you refrain from harming me, from imprisoning me, from forcibly changing me simply because of my behavior. To tolerate me isn't to accept me or to agree with me or even to understand me. But for you to tolerate also requires that you don't think I'm right in what I'm doing. You don't have to think I'm wrong. It's just that you don't agree with me. If you agreed with my behavior, then there'd be nothing for you to tolerate. Think about someone who agrees with you about some fundamental moral issue, like, for example, reparations for slavery or abortion or affirmative action. That person agrees with you. Do you have to tolerate their agreement? No, of course not. Tolerance doesn't come on the scene here. So there would be nothing for you to tolerate if you couldn't disagree with somebody. So relativism is not tolerance. According to relativism, what you do is right. And if I disagree with you, what I do is right too. Everything's right. Just right for different people. So far from increasing the scope of tolerance, relativism threatens to make tolerance impossible. I can't tolerate you if you're right. I can only tolerate you if I disagree with you. But if relativism's true, there's nothing for me to disagree with. In fact, we shouldn't see criticism of other people as disrespectful or against tolerance. Respect, at least as it's traditionally been conceived, comes via criticism from taking other people so seriously that you can disagree with what they're doing. There's this long and respected tradition in political philosophy and cultural theory that maintains that asking other people for reasons for their behaviors and giving others reasons for your own behavior is at the heart of mutual respect. And the reason for this is simple. If I see you as my intellectual and moral equal, when we disagree, I'll take our disagreement very seriously since you're intelligent and worthy of respect. If you're doing something and it's something that I don't do and I respect you, I might think, oh my, maybe I should be doing that thing. Or maybe there's some reason, reason I should consider what you're doing. But cultural relativism far from being a manifestation of mutual respect, is a position of mutual dismissal. If you and I disagree, according to cultural relativism, we should stay away from each other. We have no intellectual or moral common ground on which to base a discussion of our differences. Think about the sorts of people that you won't discuss things with maybe a really young child or somebody who's so violent in their disagreement that they would hurt you? Well, you think that a young child is just not your intellectual equal. Someone who's so violent that they would hurt you isn't your moral equal. These are the sort of people who you say, sure, sure, you're right, let's just leave it alone, and you walk away from. If you actually do respect someone, they're worthy of criticism. And if they're worthy of criticism, then they're worthy of seeing as your equal on the same intellectual and moral playing field as you. But somebody can't 
be on the same intellectual and moral playing field as you if you just dismiss their different beliefs as right, even if yours are different. In this lecture, we've taken a look at the position of cultural moral relativism, and we've seen that not only does the position have no positive support in terms of some argument in favor of it, but there are many reasons to think that the position has negative implications. Even further, the position might just be based on a confusion between the terms belief and moral fact, or the concepts of tradition and the way things actually should be. Even further, it seems like people's motivation in terms of tolerance or respect requires the rejection of moral relativism. If moral relativism in its cultural form is true, we can't tolerate differences because there are no differences. We can't respect other people because we run away from having a constructive discussion with them. Now, it's important to note that other academic disciplines use the term relativism when they don't really mean relativism. All they mean is that different people believe different things. That's not relativism. Relativism says things are relativized to these differences. Insofar as we think that there are common intellectual and moral standards between any of us, relativism is false. Thank you.